I think almost everyone's brain is prone to having this memory bias where they remember significant, extraordinary experiences in much more quantity and more vividly than everyday, ordinary experiences. I mean, it makes sense. Our brain is going to dedicate more storage space to the things that matter the most. The vast majority of the time in most people's lives is made up of the everyday, mundane, ordinary experiences. But this data is highly compressible. It's kind of like those really repetitive YouTube channels about which people say, if you've watched one of their videos, you've watched all of their videos. It's kind of like that for mundane, everyday experiences. Take, for example, washing dishes. You know, when I was, let's say, 15 years old, I probably washed the dishes hundreds of times in a year. And how many of those do I really remember? Probably a single digit number of them. It's not that I don't remember that I was washing the dishes every day. It's that since all of these are the same, like every time I wash the dishes, it's all the same thing. My brain really needs to only store one copy of that data, and it can just assume that all the rest is the same. And the brain doing this makes it so that the further back in your memories you go, the less insignificant experiences you retain. I might be able to remember what I had for breakfast yesterday or the day before yesterday, but what about the year, a year before, two years before? I won't be able to remember what I had for breakfast then. But I will be able to remember the really significant, the really out of the ordinary events that did happen one to two years ago. So my long-term memory of my life pretty much entirely consists of just the significant experiences and very little memory is dedicated towards the mundane, everyday, ordinary experiences. And I can still remember the fact that I was doing them, right? The, the mundane experiences. I can still remember, let's say I was doing homework for two hours a day. I can still remember that. But it doesn't feel like it takes up that much space in my memory, two hours every day. That's an eighth of the time that I am awake. It doesn't feel like an eighth of my memory of high school is composed of me doing homework. My most significant memories of the school experience are the fun times I had, the experiences I had with my peers, even though 80% of the time was spent in the classroom sitting down and doing work. The following is not the case for everyone, definitely isn't the case for everyone, but at least for me, this memory bias, the compression effect, it makes me find the past happier than it was. Because here's how my mood is. My ordinary, default, everyday, baseline kind of mood is just slightly negative because of all the stuff I have to do that I dislike doing. You know, um, but every now and then, I have some positive spikes in my life. And there are more of these positive spikes than there are negative downward spikes on the graph of my happiness over time. In other words, most of the time in my life experience is slightly negative, but my brain discards that because it's mundane. The extraordinary significant events that I remember tend to be more positive than they are negative. So when I'm going through the everyday, ordinary parts of my life, I tend to reminisce upon the past and go like, wow, life was so much better back then. But that's just the bias I have because I'm fortunate enough to not have my life's most extraordinary events be full of these bad, bad events. Maybe for someone else whose life contains more extraordinarily bad events than extraordinarily good events, this memory compression bias might make them remember the past as if it was worse than it actually was. So yeah, the bias that I have makes me feel as if the past always used to be better. And this creates an illusion, an emotional illusion, that my life is constantly on a downward trend, that things are always getting worse. But the thing is, although I have a bias in favor of feeling this way, it really is true. My life really has been getting worse over time in three main ways. Number one, my capability to experience fun and joy. Number two, the amount of fun and joy of the experiences that are typical of the age that I miss out on. And number three, how easy it is to socialize. So childhood happiness. Leave a comment below if you can or can't relate to this. It seems that the feeling of elation and excitement and joy just becomes more and more scarce as we get older. 
the maximum cap of how much happiness is possible to be experienced at any given moment decreases from childhood to adulthood, with few exceptions, which I'll address in a bit. You know, that childhood feeling of just pure in the moment excitement and just just going nuts, going crazy, just having the time of your life, you know. I haven't felt that in years. And I don't see how I'll ever feel it again. You know, it's like if I did the most fun thing that I could possibly do today, it still wouldn't even be 10% as fun as one single recess in elementary school. You know, that like that's how dulled my ability to experience life emotionally has become. And I'm not sure if it's depression or if it's just a natural, inevitable consequence of getting older. When I was like six, seven, eight years old, I only experienced this a handful of times. I really didn't get to do this often. But how it goes is that my parents would take me to the house of, you know, one of my parents' friends. And the other kids and I would just have a great time. We would be running up the stairs, throwing the toys, shooting the Nerf guns, playing hide and seek, just like throwing the pillows at each other, you know, scaring each other, chasing each other around. It is absolutely astounding now just how much happiness can be packed into such a short amount of time. The happiness density of those experiences was absolutely incredible. Sadly, over time, I've lost the ability to feel that amount of happiness. Like, if I did that same thing now, or let's say I went to the playground and did the same recess stuff I used to do in elementary school, would I experience anything close to that amount of happiness? Of course not, because I've grown up. But there's nothing that's grown up that can match the happiness level that those things used to provide. Some adults appear to retain the ability to feel that going crazy, just going nuts in the moment feeling of excitement. And they get that feeling by raving and clubbing, you know, going to parties, jumping up and down, chanting to the loud trap music at like a frat party. But for some of us, we don't have that ability. And I'm not saying that I don't want to party and have a good time, but I like the chill parties, kickbacks, having a good time with friends, the types of social gatherings where you can actually hear people talk, not the the jumping up and down to loud music, you know? That just is exhausting to me. But it seems that other people can get that childlike happiness from clubbing and raving. But even they lose that ability to feel that way as they grow older, as they get into their 30s. That kind of stuff just stops being fun. But what else is? What else is as fun as that stuff and as the the fun times of childhood? What else can match that? It doesn't seem that anything can. Bro, but what about getting married, bro? Bro, the fact that you need to bring up a a once-in-a-lifetime, well, hopefully once-in-a-lifetime event just to eclipse the happiness that you feel during some childhood playtime it just shows how bad things get. Oh, but what about when your child is born, bro? You well, how many times do you get to experience that in your life? Like once, twice, three times? Let's move on to missing out. So I have a huge missing out problem that just got worse as I got older. I think the first thing that I was upset about missing out on was video games as an elementary schooler. I didn't have a video game console. My parents didn't buy me games. And all the kids at school, like the, like Minecraft was all the rage. You know, they're talking about all like Sky Wars and they were all playing on on servers with each other, Minecraft server and everything. And I was missing out on the fun. You know, I didn't get to play like Super Smash Bros. All I had was the trial version of Minecraft in which the player is allowed five in-game days to play a hundred minutes. And uh, at the end of the hundred minutes, your progress is locked. So I basically just did this challenge to see how far I could get um, on the trial version of Minecraft, which didn't have multiplayer. Around the same time, I started getting into coding and game development for the first time. My dad is a very experienced software engineer, so he helped me get a head start on learning how to code. I started with Python, and later I started making these browser games, these little, these very little web games with JavaScript. I wanted to make games that other people could play. My primary motivation to make those games was a genuine interest in computer programming and game development. But I also wanted to uh, kind of make up for missing out on video games. So I I was kind of like, well, 
my parents don't let me play video games. Well, the kids at school, they're going to play my games now. Yeah, they're going to play my games. I was also chasing clout and popularity because around that age, I was starting to kind of get more familiar with the the notion of middle school and high school being a popularity contest with your social status affecting the types of social experiences you have access to. So like, yeah, this was in like fifth grade. I wanted to impress people with these games and make them like me, make them think that I was cool. But alas, the games were bad. These were not games that people enjoyed playing. Of course, because it takes years of experience to actually get good at making games. But I did learn that no one cares how hard you work. And for people who are involved in this kind of creative craft type of thing, there comes a moment of disappointment upon the realization that the average layman does not have a clue about how hard it is to create it and, again, does not care. When I was in sixth grade, a classmate in gym class asks me, why don't you just make a game like GTA V? Dude, come on, bro. Playing GTA was something else I missed out on. The first time I ever played GTA V was on a college roommate's PS5. Beyond video games, in middle school, that was the time when I started to observe just how different other kids' lives were from my own. Uh, I started to see just how much I was missing out on. Groups of friends would go out together without parental supervision. People would start getting their first kisses, their first romantic relationships, And I even heard about some people losing their V-cards. People were getting into fights. They were vaping. And middle school was the first time I made made an account on Instagram. It's the first social media platform I used. And one time I saw this video of this like popular football player guy. He was like, he had this video of him humping this doll of a woman. Like, come on, man. You're like 13 or 14. So far, it sounds like it's a really ghetto school. It really wasn't. It's not like everyone was doing it, but I was a very envious person. I had this mentality that made it so if I would see like one person do this thing, it would feel as if everyone is doing it and I'm missing out. So in my mind, I would it would just exaggerate how common these behaviors were. I mean, there is some truth to that. It's like the if this is what you see, then that's the tip of the iceberg. Just imagine what goes on behind closed doors type of thing. I didn't like what I was seeing. I thought that this type of behavior is bad for society. You know, it's something I didn't like about Western culture. I was already one of those guys, like the guys in the manosphere who criticized the degeneracy of the West. I already had that kind of mentality when I was 13 years old. But at the same time, right, as, as much as I didn't like what I was seeing in society, that is all that I wanted to be. I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to be the kid who's going to the parties, doing the drugs, kissing the girls, banging the girls, actually living a real teenage life with risk and thrills rather than just being some shut-in nerd who's practicing for a math competition. It was around this age that I was really starting to get deeply upset about the life script that was written for me. It's a phrase I heard from the YouTuber Rehab Room. Obviously, when I was in middle school, I didn't know anything about black pill. I wasn't watching Rehab Room in middle school. I wasn't thinking about it in these terms back then. But now I would use this phrase to describe how I felt. He said the phrase, dare to deny the life script that you're handed. Uh, You know, he said that about a guy who geomaxed to Southeast Asia. He denied the life script, which was to be an oofy doofy in the West. So back then, the idea that I had of what my life script was was that I was supposed to just study hard, miss out on the fun, you know, don't waste any time having pointless, unproductive fun, no fighting, no drugs, no dating, no degeneracy, just study hard, go to a good university, and it's all supposedly going to pay off in the end, because I'll have a good future and so will my children. That was like the life script that was, was taught to me. But when I got to middle school and I saw the sheer amount of happiness that other kids were able to access, not by being good kids, but by being bad kids, I started to feel very upset about the life script that I was handed. You know, how is it supposed to pay off in the end if I'm supposed to miss out on all of this? I thought, 
you're telling me that if I miss out on all of this fun in my youth, that I can I can make up for it in adulthood just by having more money, being able to buy a bigger house, being able to buy a car that goes faster than someone else's car. Like this is supposed to mi- make up for me missing out on all of these youth experiences. I wasn't buying it. I didn't see how the sacrifice would be worthwhile. I viewed the idea of sacrificing the fun in one's, one's youth to have you know, a bigger salary in, as an adult. I, I saw that as what is now known as the fine wine cope in the manosphere. It's the black pill's response to the red pill notion that the peak of a man's desirability is in his 30s and 40s. The black pill says, no, men don't age like fine wine. And I had this same attitude when I was in middle school and high school to the life script that my parents wanted me to follow. I thought it was just a fine wine cope. The the idea that I can be so happy in my 30s and 40s that it outweighs all of the fun I miss out in my youth. I just didn't see it happening. I truly believed that the vast majority of all of the happiness that a person can acquire in their lifetime is concentrated in the youth. The reason I was upset about my life script wasn't really because my parents were actively preventing me from getting these experiences. Like, I knew that girls didn't like me anyway. Even if my parents let me have a girlfriend, I still wouldn't get one. But I was still pissed that they wouldn't let me, you know, and it was, I think it was more that I was offended at how little they valued the experiences that I deemed important. How the way that they saw the world and their their attitudes towards life and success trivialized what I was going through. I didn't like the anti-intellectualism in Western youth culture, but I thought that my parents were too intellectual, that they undervalued the ooga-booga elements of human nature and happiness. To finish the section on missing out, you can probably guess how the rest of high school went. I was missing out on the parties, I wasn't getting any girls, and I was seething when I heard Chad talking to his friend at the library saying how he was at this party and he took two girls' virginities. I was seething when I was in the bathroom and then this like football team Chad guy was talking about how he was doing something with a girl in the back of a truck. I was just feeling like I was missing out on so much. This guy talked about how he is this party animal. He had this giant subwoofer in the back of his trunk. A guy told me he lost his V-card in the school bathroom. And don't even get me started on the experiences of the girls. I also didn't watch Netflix. My parents didn't even have Netflix. So I felt that I was missing out on the ability to experience the conversations about shows like Stranger Things that other kids were having. I heard the story of two students getting caught, getting at it under a stairwell. It was at a different school, if I recall correctly. The stuff about the Netflix and the porkin that was really brutal to me, of course, missing out is the biggest one, but it's also the sense that they didn't view it as a luxury privilege kind of thing. Because I know if that if I got that, I would see it as, oh, I got so lucky. Like I'm, it's really privileged to be able to experience this, right? But I knew that those kids, they, it's just like second nature to them. It's like the back of their hand, you know, it's like, it's like their Tuesday. They don't watch Netflix and think, oh, what a good childhood I have, man. They don't have fun with their girlfriend or boyfriend and think, oh, I'm so lucky to be able to have this experience. Like if they had that attitude towards it, I'd still be upset about missing out, but I wouldn't feel that bad. I talk about privilege, but I'm privileged myself compared to a lot of these kids when it comes to socioeconomic status. You know, and I could like appreciate it on a logical level. I could understand that I was very fortunate, you know. I wasn't born in the hood. I wasn't born in a poor country. I have an above average IQ. I'm not disabled. I was raised by two parents and they weren't abusive. I'm glad I'm not disabled or abused. But as for some of these other advantages that I had, you know, I could understand why they were advantages logically, but there was no emotional appeal to it because the advantages weren't advantageous for the things that I desired out of life. The kind of privileges that I got, such as being upper middle class, having high IQ, educated parents, 
it just wasn't really advantageous for the type of person that I wished to become. You know, I, I'm physically uh, not dealt the best cards. You know, I have below average height. My frame is small. I got mocked by every other kid, even by girls. And I thought, well, what good is, is high IQ? That just makes adults have higher expectations on me to use my brain. And there's no fun in being a nerd maxer. I, I just want to be that brute who's just beating up the other guys. You know, six foot five, ultra high testosterone, giga low myostatin. I want to be privileged in a different way. Because the privilege that I have, it's only, it's something that society sees as, sees as a privilege, but it's not something that makes me happy. I mean, now, years later, like my, my attitude towards it has gotten a lot more balanced because I'm very glad that I'm not from the hood. But back then, I could only envy the kids who were from rougher environments because those environments made them the, the kind of tough guy that I wish to be, you know. I thought that like, if you're from a gated community, then the only way to get as tough as the guy from the hood is to join the military and be a Navy SEAL. Like you have to put in years of dedication and discipline and training just to be as tough and hyper masculine as like the dude from the hood is automatically. But my desire to be from the hood was it had to be paired with my desire to be the six foot five ultra mager guy because I knew that if I still had my same physical cards, same physical genetics, and I grew up in the hood, it would just be over for me. You know, I would just be getting beat up all the time. I would envy people for things that I didn't even want to do. Like one time on Instagram, a girl at school posted a video of her singing along to a song and she was waving around a gun. Did I want to wave around a gun on social media? No. But I wish I had her extroversion, her outgoingness, you know, her courage, her rebelliousness, her normie brain that made it so she was the type of person who would do that. That's what I wanted to be. In high school at lunchtime once, they were playing, they had these speakers playing one of these cliche school friendly songs, you know, the school appropriate songs like the Cupid Shuffle. And there was this crowd of people dancing to it. And I felt bad about missing out, you know, but I didn't like dancing. I didn't want to dance to the Cupid Shuffle. But I was still missing out on that experience, you know, and because I didn't enjoy that, I was incapable of having that experience, which made it even worse. If you think it doesn't make sense for me to envy or want to not miss out on something that I don't like to do, just imagine a guy who was born without a sense of smell. You know, I know a guy who was born without a sense of smell. Imagine if a guy like that was upset about the fact that he misses out on like smelling roses or something. You know, he can't get it, but it doesn't change the fact that he's still missing out on the experience. So same thing with a guy who can smell, but doesn't like the smell of roses. That guy still is missing out on the experience of enjoying the smell, which because he doesn't enjoy the smell, he is incapable of having. I wanted the whole normie experience, the full package, not only the good things, even the bad parts like breakups. Because going through one would gain me the ability to use the term ex-girlfriend in a casual conversation. Things got better in university temporarily. I got to experience some of the stuff that I had missed out on for so long. But it was short-lived and now I feel lonelier than ever. I haven't had a fun social experience for like a year by now. But in my first year of university, I, I was lucky enough to meet some people from a club about a certain culture. I'm not going to say it because that might get me doxxed. That's how I got to know them. I just went to meetings for this club. I went to private invite only social gatherings with some people, which was cool. We played Never Have I Ever. I was like the, I was like the last one standing. I, I was the, the, the one that like didn't do the, the most things in Never Have I Ever. It's such a life mug, you know, it's like when when I get to finally like not miss out on the social experiences, it's just like with the way that I interact with the people there, it just I just get mugged, you know, I just get life mugged to the utter oblivion. And uh, at one time I, I, I was uh, with this Stacy I met in a school club meeting, a different club. She showed me a video on her phone of uh, when she was drunk with her friends and just like running around and, and like prancing and like, dancing around. It's just like, it was, they, they looked like they were having so much fun. Like, I've never even seen that before. Another time I was walking with her to the building that her friends lived at. She said she was waiting on a friend. And like, as the, the, the loner that I was, I only expected it to be like one person. And then this like crowd of Stacy's just walks out the door. And when I was with them, like they, they just casually like mentioned threesomes. It's just, it's just the biggest life mog, man. It's like, when I hang out with normies, like it just draws more attention to the fact that I am so unfamiliar with that lifestyle.
I envy the social lives of the college girls who are on their phone all the time. And like, if I if I like glance over at their at their phone screen as they pick it up, and like the lock screen, it's just like text message conversations. There's like I don't know, like twenty Instagram notifications, fifty Snapchat notifications. It's like they're like constantly socializing. To me, it's just utterly astonishing. Other than the people from the culture club, I had some more social experiences、um, because I joined the powerlifting team in my first year of college. I joined it as an utter novice, like I had a one-plate bench max. And after a semester, I decided to quit the team for logistical reasons. I'm not going to say what these logistical reasons are because it's information that a determined doxer can use to narrow down my location to not that many universities. The real value that I got out of it was the social, not the strength. I went to a few parties because、um, of, of the connection I had to the guys on the powerlifting team. So that was just like a, a little taste of、um, some of the stuff that I missed out on. But、um, it, well, besides that, it, besides these experiences, I went to like some th- those like paid parties that are like public entry, like not the invite only ones. You know, those that are like ten dollars for guys, free for girls. Bro, I, I was so desperate to not miss out. Like these, the experience I had at these were not great anyway. But I was so desperate to not miss out. So, so like. One time, I walked to one of these. Um, I walked like two miles, and then I like walked back. There's no point to go to these if you have no friends to go with. I haven't hung out with the people in that social circle um ever since the first year of university. My social life just kind of went to zero. Like I said before, I had I haven't had a fun social experience for like a year by now. Hanging out with them, and like I appreciate like everything that they have done because、um, you know if someone just lets me hang out with them, like that means so much to me, and I want to kind of like return the favor in in a in like a friendship way. I'd pay it forward if I were a high status, high value guy who who's like the leader of a bunch of social circles. I'm so high value that I have a surplus of status that I'm willing to sacrifice. I I would try to include the loneliest, most sub five inkwell guys just to help lonely men. You know, if I were a billionaire, I would do like a worldwide black pill convention, and any male who's under a four out of ten is gonna get like a, a free like paid ticket, paid like plane ticket, hotel, and everything. Ending male loneliness one inkwell at a time. The fun social experiences I had in my first year of university, I didn't have them often. I rarely had them, and、uh, during that year, most of the time I wasn't happy. But、uh, you know, this this is where my memory bias comes into play because now, when I th- when I think back about the first year of university, it really seems like it was a blast. It seems like it was so awesome. Because the memory is just o- only those significant events, only the s- the significant extraordinary social experiences, mundane everyday existence is just kind of discarded. Which brings us to number three, the third way my life got worse: socializing. Really took a nose dive after high school. Before I went to college, social interactions. But my r- relationships with my peers really were was not great. It was not great at all. I didn't have any close friends, but at least I had some degree of closeness and rapport with my peers, you know. But now in university, it really seems like I can't build a connection with anyone. I don't even progress past the just someone you talk to stage. Like I don't even make it into the acquaintance stage. the The experience I have of talking to other people it's just so bland. If I could describe it in a, with a phrase, I would say it's just standard communication. That's what it is. It's just standard communication, and I don't think my social skills are worse now. My social skills are the best they have been. I look back on old text conversations, old interactions, memories, and I spot the mistakes, the poor social choices that I don't make anymore, which indicates an improvement. They still aren't great. There's lots of room for more improvement. But I just can't get that kind of feeling like I used to in high school when I would see someone and seeing them would put a smile on my face, you know. And the way that we talk, there's just some kind of closeness between us, you know. We weren't close friends, but at least there was just this element of familiarity that made people fun to talk to. But now everyone I know is just that, someone I know. I feel so distant from everyone. My current situation is in part due to the fact that I never really learned how to actually build a relationship. I said that in and before high school, I was able to experience this kind of closeness, this rapport with my peers, but it still wasn't a real friendship relationship. It wasn't anything serious. It was all just gesture maxing with no real substance behind it. 
You know how people say autistic people struggle to read social cues? I'm not saying I'm autistic. I've never been diagnosed with autism. But about the, the point that autistic people struggle to read nonverbal cues, you know, I always felt like, when do I get to use nonverbal cues? When do I get to read people's emotions from their facial expressions, bro? Because the conversations I had with people at school were so surface level. It was about class, about school, about all AP physics, AP calculus, and it's about girls. It's like there was no really any, there was no deep interpersonal kind of emotional bond that actually necessitated like reading people's emotions. And, you know, I wish I had that. It's like the kinds of, you know how the, in these drama movies, they always have these scenes of just people talking face to face and you can just feel so much tension. And even aside from the words they say, it's not about the words they say. You can just tell that from the, the looks on their faces. You, you can see that there's, they feel a certain way about each other and that there's some tension. There's some like dynamic, like power dynamic between these characters. Like they'll stare at each other without saying a word for like three to five seconds. And like that nonverbal moment builds the tension and it progresses the conversation. And the music, the, the background music, the score of the movie, it complements it. You know, it's the, there's a certain mood to their interpersonal interactions. In the way I communicated with people, there just wasn't any undertone to it. There was no kind of emotional background. Like if you could film one of these interactions, there would be absolutely no music that you could put in the background to fit the mood that we were both feeling as we looked into each other's eyes. Like there, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. I missed out on so many of these emotional arc bonding, relationship building experiences. I never got to comfort a friend through a breakup. I was never close enough to anyone to do that. I never stood up for a friend when someone disrespects them. Not because not I chose not to. It's just that I'd never witnessed anyone get disrespected the way that they do in the movies and they get into a fight and everything. I never saw that. I, I've never had these adventures and like mischief, like sneaking out at night with, with, with people I know and trust. Stealing a stop sign and going to explore abandoned houses and stuff. You know, like my social life always just lacked that magic, that kind of, that thing. It reminds me of Michael in the GTA 5 trailer. He asks, why'd I move here? And he says, it's that thing. It's that magic. You know, it's, it's something about the vibe of the city of Los Santos that draws him in. You know, it's, it's simple things like when I, if I watch a movie and two characters are sitting together on a bench, you know, and there's like some piano music in the background. Like there's a tone to that kind of interaction. And I just, I just wish I had that, but I missed out. The best I got was jester maxing. I mean, I had like fun banter, laughing moments with people, but that's just so surface level. That gave me just enough social stimulation to get by. The school environment forces people to be together. It's like an assist in a video game, you know, aim assist in a first person shooter or braking assist in a racing game. The game automatically slows down your car so you can make a turn without spinning out. School basically gives me this familiarity assist, this exposure assist. The school environment automatically gives me people to talk to. I don't really have to put myself out there just to socialize. I don't have to learn real interpersonal skills to socialize in high school. This girl told me that she thought I was very social. She said I talked to everyone. And in high school, I was in group chats. So I thought I was socializing. I thought, oh, well, my social life seems pretty decent. This girl thinks I'm very social. But the reality was that I was playing with all the assists turned on because of the school environment. I never learned how to drive a car properly. Like if you play a racing game with all the assists turned on and you turn them off suddenly, you won't be able to control the car because you never learned how to actually drive. And it was a similar thing for me with social life. I was just coasting by in high school, jester maxing, having these superficial interactions and banter without actually learning how to build relationships. I got to socialize because the people are all there. And then when I went to university, when the assists get turned off or lowered and I'm all on my own, I realized that the whole time I was gaining no social skills. I left high school with zero social skills, which of course is terrible for my dating life too. Socializing and making friends, I mean acquaintances, it's just so much more difficult in university because there's so much less exposure. The frequency is way lower. 
So let's say in high school, Bob and Joe have two classes together and each class meets five days per week. So that's already 10 weekly exposures between these two guys. If they click with each other, then they'd probably see each other at lunch as well, bringing the total weekly exposures to 15, which will further enhance the ability to make a friendship. So just the fact that we were exposed to each other, that proximity, that is so helpful for building familiarity and rapport. But in university, I've never had a class with someone there's never been a student that I've had more than one class with. And every time we go to lectures, like everyone just comes in, sits down, minds their own business and leaves, you know, it's like, so, well, I mean, I see some people talking to each other, but it's like everyone just minds their own business. You know, they're always busy after the lecture, they have somewhere to go and classes meet less frequently too. Cause my classes meet twice, three times per week. So the number of exposures and, and like, I don't see them at, there's no like lunch hour. It's, a, it's like, I would never see them on campus. It's so much more atomized, you know, the amount of exposure that I get to the same people, it's just so much less. And people say, go to clubs to make friends, but clubs meet once per week usually. So the frequency of the exposure, is just so much lower. There's a lot less repetition to help carry me. And to be socially successful, I just need to have the social skills to be able to get more results with fewer exposures, with less conversation time, build more um, familiarity, build, build more rapport, build a deeper connection, just build more in less time. And I didn't acquire the skills to do that in high school because I was so comfortable just jester maxing and coasting by. Like in the real world, especially after university, there's no jester maxing. Like the older you get, the less useful jester maxing is. I mean, jester maxing is a bad strategy to use at any age. But after adolescence, it goes from being not worth the costs to just offering zero benefit and only being costs. Like you can't just be some jester maxing idiot who's talking about whatever. Like you need to actually offer value. You need to bring some value to the table. Gone are the days of being able to just coast by with this very assisted environment in which everyone's just kind of goofing around. The thing about bringing value to the table is that social skills, just being a fun person to be around, it can just be, the, it can be your value. I'm not even talking about being like a high value man type of value. You, your value can just be your personality. It sounds blue pilled, but I roomed with a guy in college who said that he never paid for alcohol. He never paid for drugs and he never paid to get into a party. Another guy told me he freeloads and he tries not to, but he still freeloads. Both of these guys are just normie guys, average height, average looks. They're not chads or women. Their social skills take them far because they're people who are fun to be around. They make people feel better in their presence. And I don't seem to do that. Like if you're a fun person to be around, you don't need to compensate with value. You being there is the value. That basically sums up the three ways my life got worse. Number one, my ability to experience the emotions, the joy of life has been dulled significantly. Number two, I missed out more and more the older I got. And number three, my social life went to zero after high school. And it never was great to begin with. So all of this disappointment, in some ways, it transformed my outlook on the future from optimistic to pessimistic. But if you look at it a different way, I've really always been the same. And when I use the terms optimistic and pessimistic in this video, I'm not talking about how optimistic or pessimistic I am relative to reality. When I say optimistic, I just mean I think the future is going to be better. And when I say pessimistic, I mean the future is going to be worse. Technically, the future can be worse and it can still be realistic or the future can be better. It can still be realistic. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to say optimistic to mean uphill prediction and pessimistic to mean downhill prediction. I used to be this blue pilled optimistic coper kind of guy. In elementary school, when I was just about to finish elementary school, one of my teachers asked me what I'm excited or looking forward to in middle school. And as I was answering that question, I just could not wipe the smile off of my face. Like I was trying so hard to suppress that grin. It was so cringe. But like that just shows how much I was looking forward to the future because I thought things would actually be so cool. I was like, oh, man, I'm going to kiss the girls in the hallway, man. Oh, I'm going to hang out with my friends after school, man. We're going to all play video games, man. Kissing the girls, man. Oh, the school dance. I'm going to the school dance, man. Oh, I'm going to get into these fights and be the tough guy, man. Oh, middle school. I'm going to be popular. I'm going to fight the bullies, man. 
You know, and when I was about to go from middle school to high school, I was also looking forward to things like homecoming, prom, oh, kissing the girls, dancing with the girls, oh, losing my virginity, man. I'm going to do drugs, man. I'm going to go to parties, man. Make out with the cheerleaders beneath the bleachers at the football game, bro. Oh, I'm going to sneak, sneak the girlfriend through the window when my parents are home, bro. I ended up doing none of those things. When I was about to graduate high school and go to university, I was also optimistic about how things would turn out there. I was like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to have freedom from my parents for the first time, man. So, so I'm going to actually go to the parties this time, bro. I'm going to play, play cup pong with, at the frat party with the bros. Oh, the beer. Oh, the, the, the nightclub, man. Dorm room party every Friday night. Getting blackout drunk, taking shots of liquor, bro. Oh, the college girls, the Tinder, bro. Oh, spring break girls, bro. I mean, by that time, I was already kind of, you know, not really expecting those things to happen, you know, but but there was still this part of me that was just hoping, you know, that, that still had the hope, even though I, I was kind of a bit pessimistic already. By that time, I was like, oh, man, things are going to get so much better. I'm, I'm entering a new phase of my life. I'm going to start taking action now. I don't know. It was like a whole mixture of optimism, realism and pessimism. So in that sense, my outlook on the near future became more pessimistic over time. However, what stayed constant, what didn't change, is that I had never been optimistic about the majority of my adult life. That optimism in elementary school, middle school, that optimism only lasted until the end of university. And after that, I, I never expected to be happy like in my 30s. I saw post-youth adulthood as a very mundane, boring, miserable existence, which is why I wasn't buying the sacrifice your youth fund to secure a better future mantra. I thought, well, adulthood is miserable anyway. Youth is where all the happiness is at. My optimism basically did not extend past youth. I always had this life ends at 30 mentality, which is a terrible mentality, but I only find joy in the types of fun that young people have. You know how they say that when we're young, we wish to grow up, but when we're grown up, we want to be young again? Well, when I was much younger, I was looking forward to growing up, but I didn't want to grow old. Sometimes I couldn't wait to grow up, but the part that I couldn't wait for was just the teens and early 20s. So like this is, it's a coincidence because even if I had the same exact attitude that I had in middle school with all the optimism and everything. I'd still end up feeling more pessimistic by this point because I'm just approaching the stage of life that I had always been pessimistic about. But the part of my outlook that did change, the difference is that I'm no longer optimistic about the rest of my youth. I'm no longer optimistic about the rest of university. It's like my brain is so fried that I don't care anymore. I don't even want to try to make things better anymore. And to expand upon this, I'm going to do a quick tangent into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I made a video about self-improvement and why self-improving with women being the motivation is okay. In it, I made a point about Maslow's hierarchy of needs that I think could have been made so much better. So here it is. Pursuing low-tier needs can produce spillover benefits that serve higher tiers and lower tiers. Maslow's motivation model is about where your motivation comes from, what types of needs motivate you at the current moment, but the action that you do that is motivated by that need, it can help many different needs. Let's say that you're motivated to go to the gym to attract women. You're motivated by tier three, the love and belonging needs tier. You want to get a girlfriend. Getting in shape improves your physical health, so it fulfills the first layer of the pyramid, your physiological needs. It also serves the second layer because it can make you more capable of defending yourself in danger. It can serve the third tier by making you more attractive to women. It can fulfill the fourth tier of needs by giving you more respect from other men. It can raise your self-esteem, making you more confident. It can raise your social status. And it can also serve the fifth tier of needs, self-actualization. By getting in shape, that's one of the things that you can do to become the best version of yourself. So just because your motivation to go to the gym is only from the third tier, let's say what if it is from the second tier? 
you want to go to the gym to stop getting bullied in school, to defend yourself against bullies at school. Regardless of what motivation, what motivates you to do that activity, that activity still helps so many tiers of this pyramid and it still helps the top tier, even if your motivation comes from a lower tier. If you ascend on this pyramid, let's say that you get a girlfriend and then your motivation, you you're start to get more motivated by the things that are higher up on the pyramid. You would have already had a head start because of the activities that helped you self-actualize, even if you weren't motivated to do that in the first place. It's a beneficial side effect that gives you a head start on self-actualization. And something that holds a lot of people back, a lot of people in the black pill slash inkwell community, something that holds a lot of them back from attaining self-actualization is the starvation problem. It's when a prolonged lack of a certain need is hindering your ability to do what it takes to fulfill that need. An example of it with a physiological need is that a man needs to hunt for food, but um, he hasn't gotten enough food and he's starving. And his poor physical condition makes it more difficult for him to hunt for food. It's a vicious cycle. And many guys in the black pill community struggle with this vicious cycle with love and belonging needs. Years of loneliness and isolation have decimated their mental health. And if you're depressed, you'll be less motivated to self-improve. Loneliness also rusts your social skills. Getting no pussy for a long period of time can hinder one's ability to acquire pussy in other ways too. For instance, a man might show traits of neediness when he interacts with women because he, that's exactly what he is. He's been so deprived of female attention, but that makes him less desirable to women. I'm experiencing this starvation, vicious cycle problem when it comes to socializing. I have no interest in going out, putting myself out there and trying to make friends anymore. I recently went to a club meeting in college and I just sat there. I didn't talk to anyone. And I was just so frustrated that I just walked out. I just left. I'm in some group chats that I just ignore. My brain is so fried. But why is my brain fried? Well, it's fried because I missed out. It's fried because I'm lonely. But why did I miss out? Why was I lonely? I've talked about the what, and now it's time to address why. So far, it sounds like I have somewhat of a victim mindset. I was complaining about all the things I missed out on, how the good things weren't happening to me. But I don't think I have a victim mindset because I recognize that it is the outcome of the choices I made. Me ending up in this situation has only one thing to blame, my actions or lack thereof. Perhaps it seemed like I was implying that my lack of social success was due to me being a sub-5 male, a below-average looking male. I don't think that is the case. If you've watched DBDR, on DBDR's channel, a lot of the time he says, uh, he titles his videos as a sub-5 male. Like, never be a cashier as a sub-5 male. It implies that being a sub-5 male is one of the key factors that is making his life the way it is, right? But I don't think I get to say um, that this is the story of me failing as a sub-5 male. I don't get to say that I've failed because that implies that I've given it an honest effort. I've really given things a go. And to be honest, I have not. I mean, sure, having strict parents can limit your freedom. It can limit some of the social experiences that you can get. But I was craving those bonding experiences, you know, that emotional arc, the camaraderie with my peers. I could have joined a sports team at school. Participating in a sports team is a great way to get a lot of these social experiences. And if I didn't have the genetics to be cut out for the basketball team or the football team, I still could have joined the wrestling team and wrestled people in my weight class. I actually did go to like the meeting at the beginning of the school year for the wrestling team. And then I got the, like the papers and everything. But then I, I just thought, oh, man, I have to go to practice, man. Oh, it's just it's too many hours. It's just too much work. It's just too much work, man. It's not worth it. You know, I just had a, I had a laziness problem. When I was 14 years old, I knew that I was falling behind socially. I knew that I was lacking social skills. So I would go on YouTube and I would watch these kinds of uh, charisma videos. I would watch Charisma on Command and this YouTube channel called Far From Average with these alpha male videos. I would watch these videos and you might say that these videos are a cult, but the, the thing is, I didn't put any of this advice into practice. When I was 14, I would watch these videos and I would not make any change to my behavior. That's not to say my behavior stayed exactly the same. I still improved socially, 
I mean, any practice and exposure is better than nothing. And I said earlier in this video that I can spot the social mistakes I made in the past, and I try not to make these anymore. But with all that being done, I think that the effort I put in is such a small percentage of the effort I'm capable of exerting. And all I did was gesture max. And gesture maxing often got me in trouble at school. The thing about the strict parents thing is that it is kind of a cope. It is kind of an excuse. Because yes, there are things that I actually just didn't have the ability to do. But I never even was a person who was always adhering to the rules in the first place. Like I often broke the rules at school to jester max and got in trouble. So I disobeyed my parents. But at the same time, I would say, oh, man, my parents won't let me live a real teenage life, man. Although there was some truth to that. It was still kind of a cope. Like, even if I followed my parents' rules to a T, I still could have done so much better than I did. I still could have made the most out of the cards I was dealt, and I definitely didn't. I didn't try to persuade my parents to let me do these teenage things because I thought that if I told them that this is what I wanted to do, then they would just, it would just backfire. You know, it would make them go even harder on making me be a nerd maxing school cell. Like, I couldn't let them know the kind of person I really was because that goes against all the hard work they put in to give me the opportunities that they gave me. If I were to tell them the lifestyle that I was interested in living, imagine if I told them, you know what, all these opportunities you've given me, I want to waste them then their emphasis on education and their grip on my life would have only gotten more firm. When they'd ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't answer with the truth. And I answered with a profession, but I, I was never a fan of the answer to that question being a profession. I don't like the idea that your job defines what you are. What I wanted to be when I grow up is to be a, a person with a certain personality and who lives a certain type of lifestyle. As long as I have that, I can't care less about the profession. My parents, like all parents basically, don't, didn't want me to engage in the de degenerate activities. But they, it's not like they didn't want me to develop social skills. They wanted me to develop social skills, to be a good communicator. But I didn't put in a serious effort to try to make that happen. That's why I don't have stories to tell like DBDR does. I posted a community poll on this channel a few months ago that asked, do you want me to make DBDR style videos? Most of the voters said yes. DBDR style videos kind of are a low hanging fruit. They're very popular and they don't take a whole lot of effort to make. But I didn't make them because I didn't have material that was suitable for the genre. I would be lying in my bed and feeling really bad about how, I, how lonely I am, how my social life is going nowhere. But I, was, I would always check myself and I would ask myself, hey, what did you do today to make your situation better? And my answer usually was nothing. The last like year or two of high school, I started getting really depressed. I would go home and I would sleep a lot. I didn't want to get up and go to school. But before that, when my mental health was better, I was enthusiastic about improving my social life. If you've watched Rehab Room, the YouTube channel, you probably have heard the way that he mocks people who are really adamant about self-improvement. Oh, I'm gonna improve! That was the attitude I had when I was 15, sophomore year of high school. I started working out. I was really enthusiastic about leveling up my social life and finally getting girls to like me. But I did little more to improve my situation than do pull-ups and use Google tasks. I still didn't give it a serious, sustained effort. This is why I don't say that it's because I'm a sub five. Because uh, there are a lot of sub fives in this community who have just faced rejection after rejection, hundreds, even thousands of rejections, just nonstop rejection. On the contrary, I haven't faced very many rejections because I haven't taken very many shots in the first place. A lot of guys in the black pill community say that your looks affect your social skills because of the positive reinforcement that attractive people get and the negative reinforcement that unattractive people get. That's legit. Looks matter. The halo effect is real. The Matthew effect is real. Attractive people are friends with each other. However, the caveat is not every sub five male really receives a whole ton of negative reinforcement so much that that's like the main so much that they can say that their looks is the main factor. That is why their social skills are stunted. A lot of sub five guys in this community have been bullied, even viciously bullied. And I was fortunate enough to not be. 
You know, have I been made fun of? Yes. Have I been picked on sometimes? Sure. Have I been disrespected? Yeah. But bullied? No. Because for me to consider it bullying, it needs to be at a certain level of severity and it also needs to be repetitive. It needs to be done over and over. The negative treatment that I received from kids at school, which really wasn't that often, it wasn't bullying. Black Pill is all about talent beats hard work, and it's all about the, the hand you were dealt in life. But some of these guys blame their looks too much, and they don't want to acknowledge that they might have been dealt a bad hand when it comes to social skills. Sure, social skills are more malleable than bones, and they still must be acquired. No one is born with good social skills, but everyone is still dealt a different set of cards in how easily they will pick up the social skills. Just like someone might have a natural talent for playing basketball, which doesn't mean that they're LeBron James when they're born. Someone might have a natural talent for social skills, or on the flip side, have a very low social skills starting point. And if that's you, getting to a normal level of social skills is going to take a lot more work than the average person will have to put in. But when you're a young child, when you're like six, seven, eight, nine years old, you're not really like thinking about all the hand you're dealt and how hard you have to work to overcome it. You're not like cognizant of the fact that you need to work harder on your social skills. I didn't really start to think in the frame of like, okay, here's a, here's my social skills problems. I need to work on this, et cetera, until I was in my early teens. And, and by that point, I was really behind. But after that, the fact that I still didn't put in work and got no excuse for that, it's a lack of effort. I think the notion that being sub five will exclude you from getting certain social milestones. It's such a modern, developed country, safe neighborhood, Zoomer generation way of thinking. Environment is utterly crucial. Just look at the kids who grow up in, you know, lower income, higher crime neighborhoods. Growing up in the hood or in Central America, South America. I'm generalizing here, but I think that it seems that the, the kids from these kinds of environments are not as, you know, socially affected by a lack of height or a lack of looks the way that black pillars from like higher standard of living places say. Let's say that there's an inkwell on an inkwell forum and he says that he's been treated poorly his entire childhood because he's sub five. And that's why he keeps to himself. That's why he's really shy and reserved. It's a stark contrast to what we're more likely to hear from a kid who's grown up in one of these poorer environments. He might say that people have called him ugly when he was younger, and that's why he learned how to throw a hook as a result of the unkind treatment he received from his peers. Rather than turning meek and docile, he became more confident and aggressive. I'm not saying that retaliating physically to something that offends you is a better way to behave. I'm just pointing out how the environment makes people develop differently. So it's not just because you're a sub five, like your looks can play a role, but social isolation is far from being a universal sub five experience. Even if we just look at safe suburban neighborhoods, it still seems to me that being a lonely male because you're sub five is the exception rather than the rule. When it comes to just being able to socialize and have friends, I've just seen so many below average looking men who do completely fine socially. And the CBP channel can attest to this. DBDR is very big on like sub five theory. Now, to be completely honest with you, I think sub five theory is a little bit overstated as so far as it applies to like broader society. Like, yeah, okay. Like if you're like, if you're like a four out of 10, then you might, um, yeah, you know, you might maybe in your entire life might miss out on like one job or something. But I don't really think it's as applied as broadly as what a lot of these guys imply. I think it applies obviously to dating, obviously. For the most part, I've seen a gazillion sub five males drinking and having a good time, working and having a good time, uh, managing a team of females and being fine. Likewise, in the more academic, nerdy types of clubs in high school, lots of guys are below average looking, but that doesn't stop them from having the social life of my dreams. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not on the level of a, the stereotypical Chad and Stacy teenage lifestyle, but it's still something that I envied. It's still something that I, I looked at and I thought, man, I wish I could experience what they are experiencing, even though they're sub five. I know this guy in high school who was a obese sub-five guy. 
He has a completely normal social life. People treated him the same way that they would treat anyone. He has friends. Before I went down the black pill rabbit hole, I didn't see any reason why he would be treated differently from other people. Because he didn't get treated differently. I also know a 5 foot 4 Asian guy with a recessed chin. And he's been dating the same girl for years. Like he's a power lifter. And black pillars will call him a gym cell. But he, he's an actual power lifter. Like he competes in meets. And he, again, he's been dating the same girl for years. I see him post pictures with friends on Instagram. He's having a completely regular, normal social life. For most sub fives, being sub five isn't a social life death sentence from what I've seen. Even DBDR, as much as he talks about how much his life sucks and how he's a sub five, he still goes out drinking with his friends. My low effort also was a problem in school. I lacked motivation to get assignments done, to turn in assignments on time. I was a chronic assignment misser and zero haver. And in late high school, when I was depression maxed, sometime in the second half of high school, I had a problem with showing up to class on time. I kept getting tardies and I couldn't get motivated to show, show up to class on time until I got you know several detentions and escalated up to an in-school suspension for tardies. Being pessimistic towards adult life, being unconvinced that uh, missing out and studying hard will pay off in the long run, yeah, it probably was a contributing factor. But it wasn't like that made me just give up on school because I sunk in a lot of time studying for the SAT, studying for AP exams, writing college application essays. I actually put in effort some of the time in school. And I really did want to go to a good university because my like anti-intellectual, I just want to be that kind of brute who beats up those guys. That was just like a middle school, freshman year of high school mindset. You know, after that, by sophomore year of high school, I've come to accept that my brain is the only thing I have going for me. So I wanted to take school seriously. I did want to go to like a top university. That wasn't just something my parents wanted me to do. Like that's something I wanted to do as well. And one of the motives actually was missing out since I saw how much I was missing out on, how different the other high schoolers' lives were from mine. I wanted to go to an environment in which everyone was a nerd. You know, I didn't want to see this stuff anymore. I wanted to go to MIT. And I'm not saying I would have had a good chance to get in even if I tried. Like, I'm not that good. But it was like MIT over the other like top ranked colleges because like Harvard and Stanford are full of party maxers and party girls. You know, and I, I was conflicted because at the same time, I wanted to have that college party experience. I wanted to get the Oh, the, the social network, Harvard final club parties, bro. On one hand, I wanted to get that ultra college experience. But on the other hand, I just wanted to have the relief of no longer having to watch other people have fun when I wasn't. So I wouldn't be surrounded by people whom I envied for how much degenerate fun they were able to have. But I ended up getting garbage grades. I almost didn't graduate high school. One would think that if I was so keen on denying the life script that was written for me that I maybe wouldn't have been motivated in school, but at least I would have been motivated to social max, to max out my social life. But I wasn't motivated to do either. So that explains why I'm a low-value loner, a failure to act. It's not because I'm sub-5. It's not because I'm a manlet. But this explanation still begs the question, well, why was I unmotivated? Why did I not go all out effort maxing, considering how strongly I wanted to change my life? Things just aren't adding up here. I've come up with many versions for this section of the video, many hypotheses that could explain why I didn't put in an honest effort. But every explanation I came up with just had some glaring flaws and it didn't seem to explain my behavior. So the current version of this section of the video will go over these hypotheses and why they didn't work. Number one, laziness. I was just too lazy and I had a problem with delayed gratification. I was just way too lazy and I needed to get some discipline. Yeah, that makes sense, right? I was unmotivated in school and I was too lazy to put myself out there and make changes in my social life. But this explanation falls flat because it fails to explain why I was so unlazy, so surprisingly disciplined at certain things. For example, I worked really hard making a 3D animation for a competition in a school business club. I joined the school talent show in high school and I practiced my act every day for like one, two hours. It was still bad. It was still bad. But I did put in the work and practice for like a month or more. And 
I did manage to complete all 30 days of No Nut November one year. So I had willpower, I had the ability to delay gratification. I was working hard on some things, but why not other things? Why not the things that I cared the most about? There's probably nothing I cared more about fixing than my social life, than, than to get the teenage experience that I always dreamed of. Another hypothesis is that I wanted to protect my ego. I wanted to make excuses so that I wouldn't have to face the reality. To illustrate what I mean, imagine a student who um, doesn't study and gets bad grades on exams. And every time he gets a bad grade on an exam, he copes, ah, oh, it's because I didn't study. If I'd studied, I could have gotten an A. I may have heard this from a video on why students procrastinate. They self-sabotage because they want to protect their ego. They want to think that it's just because I didn't study. They don't want to face the reality that they could try really hard, try their best, and still fail. They don't want to face the possibility that they might not be that smart. In other words, they don't try so they can avoid the possibility of encountering genuine failure. Yeah, so this sounds like it could work too. This sounds like a plausible explanation, except for the fact that I tried my best in the school talent show to perform a type of act that I have never done before in my life. I was willing to try my best, even if I'll still fail. And when it comes to socializing, there's no ego for me to protect. I knew that girls didn't like me. I knew that I had no charisma. I knew that I was unlikable. I didn't think that things would just instantly get better if only I tried. I knew that it, was, it had to be a multi-year process of self-development. Now, what if I just have social anxiety? Well, I did the talent show and I performed in front of a crowd. I've cold approached women before and I felt a bit nervous like any man who doesn't have much experience with women would feel if he does cold approach, but not to the point of anxiety. When I was at the club meeting in college that I walked out of, I didn't feel scared of talking to the people there. I just didn't want to. But this was recent, during a period of bad mental health. But even when my mental health was not that bad, like in elementary school, middle school, I could jester max without fear. So where's the social anxiety? Or perhaps, I may have just been fantasizing about living a better youth. But I might have not had actual hope. Maybe the real reason is that I never had hope to begin with. I didn't try because I didn't think there was a point. Now, the hypothesis that I had no hope in the first place can be easily debunked by looking at how optimistic my attitude was. So what is it? Why were my behaviors so inconsistent with what I desired? It's a problem I have to this day. If I take a personality test based on my real-life behaviors and, again, based on what I want, the results probably would be wildly different. Guess I should have named myself Turbo Mental Cell. Regardless of the reason why in the past I wasn't motivated to do more than the bare minimum, sometimes less. One thing's for sure. Looking forward into the future, if I don't fix my attitude, if my mindset doesn't change, then things aren't going to get better. Fix your attitude, bro, and you need to get a better mindset, bro, are blue pill cliches, but they're utterly critical for me. My mindset is absolute garbage. It's not going to serve me well for the rest of my life. I never was optimistic about post-youth adulthood, but I'm approaching that stage. I'm approaching the section of my lifetime that I didn't ever plan to be happy in. But since it's so close now, I'm going to have to care. What's so problematic about my mindset is that my desires, my aspirations and goals are just not in alignment with post-youth adulthood. It's not in line with living a life when we are at a more mature age. So many young men these days are self-improving. They're on self-improvement and they want to change and move away from the party alcohol lifestyle. They want to transform from this guy who goes out and parties and gets wasted every weekend to someone who's disciplined, on their purpose, working hard, building up their value to provide for their families. They're, they're going to quit smoking weed. They're going to quit drinking. They're going to quit partying. These days, that's a very common self-improvement path for young men in their early to mid-20s. But for me, for me, that lifestyle that those self-improvement guys are trying to improve away from, that partying, socializing, kind of having fun with friends, just drinking, that lifestyle is my goal. That is what I want to self-improve towards. You see the contrast here, right? Two bad elements of my mindset, I think, are too much envy, you know, too much green grass syndrome, grass is greener on the other side type of thinking, and having too degenerate 
two hedonistic aspirations and goals. In the black pill community, people who are negative, not everyone in the black pill is negative, the people who are negative generally have two categories of negative attitudes. They're either a doomer or they're a seether, or there's something in between, a mixture of both. But the two categories of negative mindsets that we see in the black pill community are the doomers and the seethers. The doomers, if I could sum it up in one sentence, it's people are unhappy and so am I. And these types usually talk about how the dating market is getting worse for the bottom 80% of men, right? The vast majority of men, how the West is going to collapse. That's what some of them talk about. How uh, basically how things are getting worse, how we live in a social dystopia, how dating is getting worse for men. That's not to say that it's inherently doomeristic to discuss these topics or that these these beliefs can only be the result of a negative mindset. There are plenty of people who don't have negative mindsets towards life, and they still talk about these things. It's just that the, the people who have the doomer mindset tend to, th this is the kind of negativity that they have. Everything is getting worse. Every, everyone is unhappy, stuff like this. On the other hand, the seether types, they have a different type of negativity. They usually focus on how, on what they don't have, but other people do. If I could sum up the seether mindset in one sentence, it would be, they're happy and I'm not. The interesting thing about the seether mindset is that while it's considered a negative mindset, its worldview really isn't that negative, right? It actually is quite a positive worldview because a seether believes that there is plenty of happiness in the world. The negative part of the mindset is just the belief that they don't have access to it. They think that the majority of people have, have uh, the happiness and a small minority of people are left out and they happen to be in that minority. Unlike the doomers, when the seeders talk about how things are getting worse, their primary focus isn't on the state of the modern dating market, how dating apps have destroyed the dating market for men. Rather, they talk about they missed out on their youth experiences. They missed out on teen love. Let's take a look at an example Let's say that both a doomer and a seether see a 4 out of 10 man and a 6 out of 10 woman holding hands in public. Because of the different natures of their thought processes and emotional states, they have different reactions to the sight that they see. The doomer would react, oh, this guy probably isn't doing very well. He, he's an oofy doofy. He's probably a beta box. He's probably in a dead bedroom relationship. The doomer wouldn't look at the 4 out of 10 man's life in a positive light. And what about the seether? Well, the seether would react, that's love that I didn't experience. I'll never have this. What the seether looks at is how positive the 4 out of 10 man's life appears to be compared to his own life. Not everyone in the black pill community is negative, but of the negativity that we do see, it generally falls into two classes. It's either doomeristic negativity or it's seetheristic negativity. By the way, when I use the word negative, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I say negative in a purely descriptive way. Something can be true and negative at the same time. If you go on a black pill forum and just look at the titles of the threads, of the threads that are negative, it'll either be doomeristic talking about how dating has gotten really bad for men or it'll be seetheristic. Man, I saw this couple holding hands and that just makes me realize I'll never have this rage fuel. As you can tell from the video, I'm more of a seetheristic than a doomeristic person. I have some doomeristic outlooks on the job market and, and career. It's, it's like a tech lead type of doomerism, you know, the YouTuber tech lead. I think, oh, it's, it's going to be over for programmers, man. ChatGPT is going to replace us. Man, it's, it's over for code cells in 2024. Coding is dead. With that being said, my attitude in general is mostly seetheristic. Blue-pilled normies often say, don't compare yourself to others, bro. There are contexts where you should compare yourself to others. Let's say that you are applying for a job position and you need to, to know what your competition looks like, how you can gain an edge over them. Say you're applying for admission to a university and you need to know where the other students who are applying, where they stand, so you know where you stand among them. You know, like your, your class rank, you know, like if you're at the top of your class, like that literally is comparing yourself to other students. Don't compare yourself to others can be a cope sometimes, but they do have a point, and there's a lot of comparison that is mentally unhealthy and is not a productive form of comparison. For instance, jealousy and envy. These aren't healthy forms of comparison. Now, even though envy and jealousy are negative uh, emotions overall, 
there, there still is a silver lining some of the time. Being envious of someone else's success may motivate you to pursue that success harder. But that silver lining only exists if you have a particular kind of envy. And if you have the other kind of envy, then that might as well be completely useless. Like there's no benefit to feeling that kind of envy. What am I talking about? Well, the first kind of envy I call results-centric envy. It's when a person is envious of someone else's results or their successfulness. And they don't care if they have to work harder than the other person did, than the person they envy did to achieve the same thing. Say that you envy someone who is a millionaire at 25 and you, you work, you, even if you have to work harder than they did to become a millionaire, and let's say that you don't make it at 25, maybe you only become a millionaire when you're 30. If that's your outlook, you won't have a problem with it. The thought that you won't get that success in the same way, that doesn't bother you. You know, you just want the success part. You just want the fact that he's a millionaire to be your reality as well. But if you have to work harder or longer than the millionaire you envy, you're fine with that. The second form of envy is the whole package envy. You envy not just the end result, but the whole package. You envy the journey, the process they took to get that result. You also envy the circumstances they had, the inherent advantages that they had. You don't just want to get the success they have. You only want to get it in a way that's as easy or easier than the way that they got it. You desire their ends and their means, not just their ends. What you desire is to get the whole experience of a particular aspect of someone else's life. The whole package type of envy includes the envy of reward to effort ratios. You envy people who have high reward to effort ratios, people who seem to get a lot without having to give a lot. And also the envy of what someone else didn't have to do. So when someone has something that you want and they, they didn't have to do something that you think you need to do to get that, you go like, man, I wish I could be in their shoes so that I could, so I could also not have to do that thing and still get what I want. And this is the form of envy that I have. I have the whole package envy. I envy high reward to effort ratios. Some people say that the harder that they had to work to earn their success, the more satisfied they feel at the end. And I could never relate to this. Like, how can I feel good about the fact that I had to put in a whole bunch of effort? I would much rather achieve the same results with as little effort as possible. The fact that I had to work really hard doesn't make the end result any more satisfying. It's the opposite, really. The more effort I have to sink in to get a reward, the less worth the effort the reward is. Actually, though, scratch all of what I just said. The harder I had to work, the more relief I feel at the end upon reaching the goal because I no longer have to work hard. So if you include that as part of the reward of the success, then I, I can relate to those guys. You know, it does feel more satisfying the harder I had to work, but that the satisfying part is just the relief. It's it's not about me being satisfied about how much work I put in. It's more like being satisfied about how I don't have to work hard anymore. I think the relief factor is often confused with the, the hardness of the work making the achievement more satisfying. When it really is that way for some people, they truly do feel good about having earned their success. But lots of the people who say that it works that way for them I think many of them are really referring to the feeling of relief that the suffering is over. I'll conclude the section on envy with a few examples. If another student and I get the same score on a test in school, and I studied for five hours and they studied for one hour, I will envy the fact that they didn't have to spend as much time studying for the exam, so they had more free time. I'll envy that they had an easier, more efficient experience that allowed them to get more happiness from other areas, despite both of our scores being the same. The thing about envying someone else's less study time, it, it can actually be a results-centric envy, because being able to study efficiently and to learn more in less time, that in, in and of itself is also a result. That's something that you can acquire. It's a skill that can be learned by learning study techniques and stuff like that. But for me, it's just, it's, it's a whole package envy. So even if I can reduce my study time by using a technique, I'll still envy the fact that the other guy didn't have to learn the study technique. Another example, if I see a fat, ungroomed man with a girlfriend, I'll envy him. And aside from the obvious, the fact that he has a girlfriend, what I envy about him is the fact that he skipped the requirements. You know, the, 
we're told that we need to be in good shape, have discipline, take care of ourselves to be able to have a chance in the dating market. So when I see a guy who is an exception to that rule, I'm envious about how he manages to kind of skip the line. You know, he the, the, the rules don't apply to him. That aspect is something that that I envy. I don't envy the fact that he's fat. Like that's that's a disadvantage in so many areas of life. I don't want to be fat myself, but I do want to not have to get in good shape just to get a girlfriend. I want to get in good shape anyway, but I envy the fact that he has a lower requirement. He gets to skip the the common requirement. He gets more bang for his buck out of life. He he gets more without having to to give a whole lot, you know? Having the form of envy that I have is definitely not conducive to positive, mature self-development. Like I also envy, just like that fat, ungroomed guy who man manages to get a girl, I envy people who manage to get a lot more happiness than me despite not needing to develop self-control, emotional maturity, responsibility, accountability, character traits that take a lot of work and a lot of time to develop. Like when I see someone who seems to not have these traits but still is like 10 times happier than me, that's what I want. I want to be able to get the happiness from life without having to put in the work to follow the, the conventional script for what you need to have in order to live a fulfilling life, such as the self-discipline, the maturity, the A scoring, the book reading. I feel like why what's in it for me to work on myself when I see these people getting way more happiness than me and it, it seems like they don't even need to work on themselves to get that. Like my father would always say how important it is for me to wake up early in the morning. But I would think, what, what am I doing waking up at 7 a.m. when this guy over there wakes up at 11 a.m. and he's 50 times happier than me? Needless to say, this mindset is utterly garbage for self-improvement and won't serve me well for the rest of my life as an adult. One of the key prerequisites to self-development is that you need to have the capability to be okay with doing things that other people don't do. You need to learn to be okay with working harder than other people. Take, for example, some, some advice that Hamza gives, right? Gratitude journaling, meditation. If you're the type of person who just can't tolerate working harder and doing different things than other people, then you're not going to do, do any of these things because you're going to go like, I don't want a gratitude journal. No one else does that. I don't want to meditate. Who meditates? This, these guys over there, they don't meditate. Look how great their lives are. Look at Chad and Stacy over there. They don't gratitude journal. So why should I? They, they ha probably haven't read a book in the, in the past year, yet their lives are incredible. We're all dealt different hands in life. And if you're constantly going around feeling pissed that you don't have someone else's hand, then your happiness levels aren't going to be as high as they could be. Your drive and motivation may be suboptimal as well, until you fix your attitude. How to do that, I don't know. But us in the black pill community shouldn't underrate the importance of internal factors on our quality of life. Of course, what we have externally is a source of our happiness, but our ability to extract the happiness from what we have also plays a role on how much happiness we actually get in the end. Having the attitude that I do basically makes your brain needlessly generate unhappy emotions. Because for me, there are scenarios that are damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, it's, let's say I'm in high school and I write an essay and someone else in the class gets an A plus on the essay, but um, I find out that they paid for someone to write it. Now, I'm going to I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to be like, man, this guy, he didn't need to work hard. He cheated the system. He he got around the requirements. He's getting more bang for his buck. What am I doing sitting here coping with ma honesty? When this guy has more free time to enjoy his teenage life and has an upper hand over me, he has an edge over me in the college admissions process. How am I supposed to be happy about my, uh, honesty, cope? Well then, why don't I just pay for someone else to write my essay too? Well, therein lies the problem. Even though sometimes I'm envious of immoral people, I'm oftentimes not immoral enough myself to want to do that immoral thing. I'm not saying this to virtue signal, it's just like my natural reaction. If I paid for someone else to write my essay in school, I probably would feel bad. Doing that's not something I would be proud of, right? I definitely wouldn't be happy about what I did. And I just don't want to do it in the first place. I don't want to pay for someone else to write my essay for me. So it's damned if I do, damned if I don't. If I pay for someone else to write my essay, first of all, that's not something I want to do, but I'm pretty sure that even if I did do it, I probably wouldn't be happy. 
But if I decide to write the essay, I'd still be unhappy about having to take a path that's harder than the path my competition took. Given that I'm someone who has these mental qualities, the question arises about whether what I desire out of life truly are, you know, standalone desires, if you will, the kind of desires that that someone might have if they're passionate about being a singer or passionate about being a doctor. Or are they just the manifestation of a a more general desire of wanting what I don't slash can't have? Even the examples that I gave for this, the quote-unquote standalone desires, some of these these passions still might, you know, be in be a result of other desires. For example, someone might want to be a martial artist because they've been bullied in school and they want to feel tough and feel strong and finally have it their have it be their turn to to have the physical power, right? Someone might want to be famous because they, they're they insecure about being low status, right? Desires can come from other desires. So for those, like regardless of what the, the underlying motive really is, if they get what they want, they're still going to satisfy some, some part of their desire, right? If the low status guy gets famous, you know, the, the desire for fame may not have been a quote unquote standalone desire, but at least it did satisfy his desire for status, right? But, but here's the problem with me. That if your desire comes from, uh, you know, just in general, wanting what you can't have and having a green grass mindset, thinking the grass is greener on the other side, envying other people, there's a very real chance that if even if you get what you want, you're still not going to be happy because that desire is just it comes from a relative desire, the, the desire that's always desiring whatever it is that you currently don't have. Thus, if what you have changes, so does the desire. I used to believe that a six foot six mega jacked Tyrone in prison is actually happier than a five foot seven nerdy software developer working for a Silicon Valley tech company. I really believed that a Giga Chad, Giga Tyrone in prison is living a happier life than the nerd making a six figure salary in tech. Maybe that's true, but the reason why I'm reluctant to believe that now, that that I'm leaning more towards the belief that that's not the case, is because I'm aware that my assessments of these types of people's happiness levels is nothing more than a projection of the things that I want. The things I want aren't good for society either. To live a low responsibility, low maturity, low discipline lifestyle that's full of indulgence, stuff like this being widespread, comes back to bite us uh, when women have poor character. And there's an epidemic of weak men these days. Lots of guys in the manosphere, myself included, look at the behavior of modern women, look at society, the state of the West, and we don't like what we see. I'm just like the young women who just want to have fun and don't want to better themselves. If my dreams come true and I get that lifestyle that I always wanted, I would be a hypocrite maxer. But that doesn't change the fact that these are still the things I want. If mental maturity is not wanting these things, then I should just stop wanting what I want. Just don't want what you want, bruh. It doesn't work that way. While on one hand, I don't want to contribute further to the problems that I see and dislike about society. You know, I'm, I'm not proud to say this, but it's true. I feel so deprived of happiness that my desire to be happy overrides my care for society. It's degenerate, but I just want to be happy. Problem is, I just can't seem to find the appeal in being happy in a mature way. There's this concept of higher pleasures and lower pleasures in philosophy. This Harvard lecture goes over them. Now, I'm not going to talk about John Stuart Mill's work and his philosophy. The video, this video is already long enough, and that gets that's going to get really complicated. So I'm just going to talk about how like boomers and Xers apply a similar concept in the way that they advise Zoomers, young people, to persuade them to, you got to be happy the right way. I can't help but see the distinction as something that that humans created to incentivize people to avoid vice. It's like dangling a carrot on a stick to try to keep the wheels of society turning, especially as an incentive for young people who are the most tempted to engage in the lower pleasure activities. I do believe that as people grow older, what they enjoy changes over time. As people get older, the ratio of how much enjoyment they can gain from the higher pleasures to how much enjoyment they can gain from the lower pleasures tends to increase. 
But that's the thing. For young people, higher pleasure is a cope. Just when it comes to individual rewards, because pursuing higher pleasures involves more contribution to society. I think they do have more utility than lower pleasures have, but do non-religious hyper-individualistic zoomers give a shit? No. I just can't help but think that the higher pleasures, like going to an opera, it's just boomer cope. It's just boomer quote-unquote fun when lower pleasures are the actual fun. Higher pleasures is just something that boomers do to cope because they're too old for the lower pleasures anymore and they need something to justify their beta boxing. They need to go to a fine restaurant and pay like $500 for some gourmet dish in which the food takes up 5% of the plate's area to cope and say I've reached the pinnacle of life. That's just how I feel. I feel that when the idea that higher pleasures will make you more happy than lower pleasures is sold to young people, I feel that this is akin to what parents do to discourage their children from degeneracy. I mean, most parents, most of them believe that partying really won't make you happy in the long run. But even then, they're still going to downplay the happiness that you'll get, right? They're still going to tell their child that it'll give them less happiness than what the truth is. It's understandable. Imagine if you had, if you're raising a teenage daughter, wouldn't you want to, you know, exaggerate the downsides of partying and, and sleeping around? You know, of course, there are there are actual downsides, but, it, you know, it's understandable why a parent would want to exaggerate the downsides and kind of, you know, downplay the, the happiness gains. You just want to disincentivize your, your child from living a degenerate life. And I feel it's fundamentally the same thing when it comes to this higher pleasure, lower pleasure concept. Higher pleasures really are not more rewarding for the individual. They're for society, but we lie and say that they're more rewarding for the individual in order to get people to do what's better for society, to discourage people from being a drain on society by indulging in lower pleasures. And the thing is, if many people do fall for the cope and they follow and they pursue higher pleasures and avoid the lower pleasures, it actually will benefit the individual in how the benefit will will go out to improve the communities. You know, it, it'll strengthen our communities and, and the benefits are going to come back to us. Then we'll be able to reap the benefits. Video games, partying, and drugs may give individuals more happiness than getting an education gives. However, living in a society where people are educated and don't do drugs is a happier experience than living in a society with lots of drugs on the streets and uneducated, illiterate people. So I believe it's worth it on the macro scale. But how much do I care about society? Enough to talk about it, not enough to act on it. I truly am stuck in my teenage years, like DBDR said. Mine's probably even worse than his. My preferences are so youth-centric that I find, you know, people in their late 20s and older doing everyday activities to just be repulsive and cringe. It's not it's not the people who are repulsive, but it's just like the idea of, of living that way that is cringe. It's like if you're 27 or older and you like go to the grocery store, that, that's just cringe. It's just cringe and repulsive to me. If I watch a video of like a 21-year-old woman traveling with her girlfriends on a girl's trip to like Vegas or something, that's not cringe to me. But if you're like a 37-year-old or like a 55-year-old traveling to Costa Rica and looking at the sloths and the monkeys, when you're wrinkled and balding, it's just, it's just cringe to me. Like that kind of way of living, is, is that plane of existence is just cringe. Like there's nothing that you can do at a boomer age that isn't cringe. Everyone who's older than like 24 who's watching this video right now is probably cringing at me. But this is just how I feel. I have no interest in like mature adult maxing. You know, if I have to, if, if there's a company that, that has a, like a team building activity, you know, I, I don't even want to go socialize with the, like the t 32 to 36 year olds. Like the thought of having to go to this like team building activity or a company like work party. It's just like, come on, man. It's just so lame. All of these people are just too old, man. One time in university, I met one of my roommates from the previous year, and he said that it looks like I matured. And, you know, he, I might act more mature, you know, but if only he knew what I valued and desired, I still just want that teenage experience. And like I said before about how, you know, that the ratio of the happiness that you're able to gain from higher pleasures versus the happiness that you're able to gain from lower pleasures increasing with age. I'm getting older and at some point you're you're unable to get that teenage experience. It wouldn't feel natural because you you're at an age where you you'll process it differently, you'll experience it differently, right? Let's say that 
you're a kid and unfortunately you never got to go to a playground. You'll say that you never got to go on the monkey bars and play like catch with your friends. You never got to play tag on the field, swinging on the swings. If you're 32 years old and you go and do these exact same activities, you're not going to get the same experience. You're not going to get the same enjoyment that you would have had if you did it as a kid. You can do the things you wanted to do, but you won't get what you wanted to get out of it. And like like what I said about Boomer Cope, you lose the ability to, to experience these kinds of fun and you're going to have to resort. You're going to have to adapt to having fun in more boring ways because that's all you can do. Like it, it is true that that you miss the boat, you miss the boat. I see a lot of cope on Reddit when people say that, oh, it's not that bad that you missed out on the college experience. You can still party when you're 35, but that's a cope because if what you want isn't just to party, but to get an experience, a certain type of experience, the experience of being young and dumb, having carefree fun while being at the peak of your physical attractiveness, discovering the adult aspects of life for the first time, you won't be able to get that experience at 35. It is what it is, but beyond the ages when one is able to get that kind of experience, beyond that age, any mental effort spent thinking about missing out and oh, and what could have been, essentially, it is a waste of CPU cycles. It's mental energy that could be better spent elsewhere. So as long as you're, you're truly too old to get that experience, once you get too old for the experience, the sooner that you get over missing out, the better. But how do you do that? If it was easy to get over missing out, then everyone would get over it. So many guys in the black pill community who are older and too old for the teenage shenanigans that they missed out on are just still like they're at 30 and they're reminiscing upon how their teenage lives could have been better. And they're still sad about missing out on their teenage lives. And again, it's just a waste of mental processing power because you can't turn the clock back. It would be advantageous for me, I think at this point in my life, to make my desires more mature. But how? How do I do that? The teenage, the young life, you know, is like the 15 to 21 lifestyle. That's, that's still all I want. And if I continue to want this years into the future, if this is still what I want when I'm in my 30s, then man, that is a really sad mindset. I hope it doesn't come to that. Final section in this video. I wish I were religious. If I had grown up in a religious household, internally, things would be better. And as a result, I would do better externally. I think one of, if not the biggest tools, the, the biggest benefits of religion as a tool is how it translates something that is a benefit on a macro level, that's something that's a benefit to society, benefit to others, but isn't a benefit to the self, to the individual, or is a long-term benefit but doesn't have enough appeal for people to want to do it. It translates these things into benefits to the individual. It creates incentives. Let's say even if I'm religious and I'm still not convinced that making the sacrifice of missing out on the degenerate fun to better myself as a person will pay off in this lifetime, I'd be motivated to do the good things regardless of whether I think they'll pay off and be worth it for me in this lifetime because I, I believe there are rewards and punishments outside of this lifetime on earth. Having religious beliefs would make me feel good about being moral, doing the right thing, even if it means that I get less bang for my buck. I bet that if I were religious, I wouldn't be jealous of immoral people having the upper hand, because I'd believe that justice will always be served. The data shows that religious people are happier than non-religious people are. This phenomenon exists across various cultures. The problem I have with what I believe should be done not being in alignment with what I want to do because the incentives aren't strong enough for me, believing in a religion would help mitigate this problem. There's no guarantee it'll solve it. There's plenty of religious people who are still selfish. But the data shows that religious people are more likely to volunteer and donate to the poor. This has been my audition for the next DBDR, and if you think I'm a good fit for the role, then I implore you to give the like button a soft punch and leave a comment. Subscribe if you're new and stay tuned. There's an abundance of high-value black pill content I got lined up for you. As always, thanks for watching.